guys and welcome to Heart of Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about quite an interesting pathology and that is the persistent cloaca. So let's get started. So what is a persistent cloaca? Persistent cloaca is a complex anorectal congenital disorder which occurs exclusively in newborn girls in approximately one in every 20,000 live births. In this disease, the rectum vagina, and urinary tracts meet and fuse, creating a single common channel called a cloaca. The etiology of persistent cloaca is currently unknown. So if you look at this picture on my right, you see there's something drastically wrong with the anatomy of this female newborn. And we see that the fecal tract, the reproductive tract, and the urinary tract are meeting in a single common channel. And this is why the disease is named cloaca. So first of all, we know that our rectal tract is supposed to open in an orifice down here, and that is called the anus. We then have our reproductive tract, which is made up of the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina, and that has its own tract, which opens up as the vaginal orifice. And then we have the bladder, which sends the urethral tract to open up as the urethra. So in the normal anatomy of a newborn female, we usually see three different openings or orifices. But as you can see, in patients with persistent loeca, we have just this one opening or orifice, and we have the joining or the combining of these different tracts that are usually actually not supposed to combine at all. So as you can imagine, this is actually quite a complex disease because now we have the mixing or the passage of substances from the rectum, which holds the fecal matter, into the vagina and into the bladder, which contains the urine. So the urine is now able to go into the vagina, so is the fecal matter, and all of these substances can mix. And this is not very good for the patient, because as you know, we have different sorts of normal flora, bacteria, and microorganisms which are found in these different compartments. And when they mix, they're able to cause all sorts of infections. So this is actually what makes cloaca a very difficult pathology to deal with. So let's go a little further and learn more about the disease. The clinical presentation. The persistent cloaca is diagnosed clinically. After a female baby is born, the doctor who examines her will see that she only has one opening instead of three. In many cases, this opening is hooded and elongated. The external genitalia often appear small in the child and examination of the abdomen may reveal an abdominal mass which likely represents a distended vagina, which is called a hydrocolpus, and is present in about 40% of patients with persistent cloaca. So if you look at these two images below, on the left we have a cross-sectional view of the normal female anatomy of a newborn. So this is a patient without cloaca, and on my right we have a patient with cloaca. So as you can see in this image, we have our rectal canal, which opens up as the anus, here we have the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina, which opens up as the vaginal orifice. And then we have the bladder, which sends the urethra down here. And these are actually the one, two, and three different orifices that we can find on a normal female newborn baby. But as you can see in patients with cloaca, we have this common one orifice that can be seen on a clinical examination. So the urethral tract together with the vaginal tract and the rectal tract fuse and create a single common tract which is now responsible for these different functions. So from the single orifice, the newborn will begin to pass the urine as well as the fecal matter. The management of the disease. The goal of early management is to detect associated anomalies, achieve satisfactory diversion of the GI tract manage a distended vagina, and divert the urinary tract. So before we go any further, I just want to say a few words about this. So because these tracts have different kinds of content within them, and they usually aren't allowed to mix, the first thing we need to do is find a way to separate these different channels or tracts and to divert the different streams. So the urinary flow will be diverted in one way, the fecal stream will be diverted in another way. So the first thing we do is the diversion of the fecal stream, and this is done with a colostomy, which is placed in the descending colon and allows for ways to exit the body. So as you can see in my picture here down below, we have that newborn with a stoma placed over the descending portion of the colon 
and that fecal waste is able to drain directly into this bag. The distended vagina is a common cause of obstructed urinary tract because of its pressure on the trigger. Therefore, once the vagina is decompressed, the urinary tract may no longer be obstructed. If the hydrocolpus is not drained during the newborn period, it can become infected and can lead to vaginal scarring. So as you can see in this image down here, we have a very enlarged vagina and that is actually due to a hydrocolpus. And this is because we have fluid which has collected in that uterus and the vagina and it now also compresses the bladder and the urethra and prevents the flow of urine. So a lot of these patients will also have a urinary tract obstruction because of this hydrocolpus. So the best way to treat this is to drain the hydrocolpus, meaning drain the fluid out of that area to unobstruct the urinary flow and also to prevent this fluid in there from becoming infected. Drainage of the urinary tract, this is usually achieved after the decompression of the gynecological system which is connected to it. So that is what we just spoke about, the drainage of the hydrocolpus. Urinary diversion such as the Mitrofenov procedure and the use of intermittent catheterization can also be done and are usually successful in preventing a urinary tract obstruction. So now that we've taken care of the fecal stream, we've drained the fluid within the vagina and the uterus, the last thing we need to take care of is the urinary tract and its drainage. So usually if we do drain the gynecological system, we can essentially unobstruct the urinary flow. So the patient will be able to pass the urine quite smoothly. But in patients in which this is not possible, we can try the Mitrofenov procedure. And this is a surgical procedure in which the appendix is resected by a process called an appendectomy and is used to create a conduit basically a connection between the skin surface and the urinary bladder. So in this process, as you can see in my picture above, the patient's appendix is resected and this is used sort of like a tube or a channel. It's inserted into the bladder and we create a channel for the drainage of the urine to the surface of the body. So usually it's the umbilicus which is used as the opening of this tract. And in this way, the bladder is able to drain out. So this is the most essential part of the management is the diversions of the different tracks to prevent all of these substances from mixing with one another. Other abnormalities. So if you remember in the slide before, we said the goal of early management is also to detect other abnormalities. Because patients with these cloacas usually have other associated abnormalities. Identifying other abnormalities or defects is also essential in the diagnosis and treatment of cloaca. The abnormalities typically found involve the urinary system, the gynecological organs such as the vagina and the uterus, and the lower back and spinal column. So now let's talk about the abnormalities found in the urinary systems and the gynecological organs. About half of patients with cloacas also have a defect affecting the urinary and gynecological organs. Some children may have only one kidney or they have urine that backs up into their kidneys and this is called vesico-uteral reflux. So vesico means bladder and ureter means the ureters here. And vesico-uretary reflux means that the urine after collecting in the bladder is now refluxing or getting back into the ureters or the enlargement of the kidney drainage system, and that is hydronephrosis. So if the urine backs up all the way up to the kidney again, it will cause the kidney to inflame or become larger, and that is called hydronephrosis. Another potential problem is the hydrocolpus, and this is something we spoke about before. In this condition, the fluid collects within the vagina and the uterus that may press against the base of the bladder neck, causing the blockage of the ureters which does not allow them to drain into the bladder. So again, we said that the hydrocolpus is also a cause for a urinary flow obstruction. About half of girls with cloaca will have problems with gynecological organs that may affect these organs functions later in life, including the ability to give birth. So continuing with the abnormalities, we can also have spinal and sacral defects in these patients, the sacrum or small bones found in the lower back can often be affected. Sometimes, one or more of the bones may be missing. 
More often though, the sacrum may be smaller and not formed correctly. In some cases, the spinal cord may be incorrectly positioned within the bones of the spinal column and this condition, called tethered cord, may need repair. So if you look at this picture, this is actually just the way in which we can diagnose a sacral abnormality by the use of the normal sacral ratio. So we can see that we use BC over AB and the normal ratio is 0 0.77, but children with anorectal malformations may suffer varying degrees of poor sacral development. We have never seen a patient have poor bowel control with sacral ratio less than 0 0.3 and greater than 0 0.7 usually is associated with a good bowel control. Patients may often have a hemisacrum, which is the complete loss of one side of the sacrum. So we only have one side of the sacrum, which is actually found in them. And they may have all different sorts of abnormalities in the formation or the size, as well as the shape of the sacrum. Imaging and testing. The pediatric surgeon will order tests to get images of what is going on inside the baby's body. These tests may include an ultrasound of the kidneys, bladder, and other pelvic organs to evaluate for urological anomalies and a distended vagina, which as we said before, is a hydrocolpus. So again, remember we said that these patients may be born with just one kidney or a malformation with the kidney. They may also have hydronephrosis and all this can be diagnosed based on the ultrasound. We can also do cystoscopy and vaginoscopy, which are essential components for the evaluation of the patient. Magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is necessary in infants older than three months to evaluate for the presence of tethered cord and other spinal abnormalities if ultrasonography was not performed in the neonatal period. The anatomic questions that can be answered include the following. The length of the common channel, so the length of the cloaca, the presence of the vagina, the presence of a hemivagina, the presence of the cervix, and the visualization of the rectal fistula. Continuing with imaging and testing, we can also do an echocardiogram to check for any cardiac abnormalities an x-ray of the spine and the sacrum, and a spinal ultrasound. And these tests can show spinal anomalies such as spina bifida and spinal hemivertebra. Plain radiography of the sacrum in the anterior, posterior, and lateral projections can also reveal sacral anomalies such as a hemisacrum and sacral hemivertebrae. And finally, a blood test. A newborn with untreated obstructive uropathy may have acidosis or decreased GFR or glomerular filtration rate and this can be demonstrated by an elevated cystatine level. And finally, the treatment. In cloaca, fecal diversion prior to definitive repair is by far the safest approach. Therefore, the operations are performed in stages. The newborn fecal diversion and urinary and vaginal diversion, if necessary, is performed first. Definitive repair is then performed at a later date, followed by the vinyl operation of the cholestomy closure. So as we mentioned in the management slide, the first thing we need to do as soon as possible is to divert the different streams. And once this process is achieved, we can go on to the surgical therapy. Surgery is essentially needed to treat most of cloaca's problems. As the baby ages and becomes more stable, doctors are able to consider performing different surgeries to reconstruct the different malformed organs. This typically happens between the ages of six months and one year of age. The reconstruction involves separating the rectum from the common channel and then using the remaining tissue to create a vagina and a urethra. This is most easily accomplished when a common channel is short, meaning less than four centimeters. The goals of surgical treatment are to achieve bowel control, urinary control, and normal sexual function. So essentially in these patients, a number of surgeries will be required to create proper borders or separations between the different tracts and organs involved so that the child has complete bowel control, urinary control, and normal sexual function. And that brings us to the end of this video on cloaca. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. I hope you found this presentation very interesting and informative. If you would like to download a copy of the presentation, you can click the link in the bio. Take care and bye for now.